What's happening, Pod Squad? Welcome into episode 92 of the show uh, solo today. And I wanted to share with you some insights that I really think are going to be helpful if you have a pavement maintenance business and you're growing it, let's say around the $500,000 mark, maybe more and maybe even less. I want to share with you something so important that um, we have really been focusing on and we focused on a lot in 2023, towards the end of 2023, um, middle of 23, and something that I've seen uh, so important in other businesses as well, some of the businesses that I'm working with one-on-one, this, this thing that I'm going to talk about could be a major roadblock in your business from stopping it from growing past that 500,000, past that million dollar mark. And I call it the separation of sales and operations. Uh, I can't wait to talk about this. Matt was not as excited for this topic, but it is riveting. It's fantastic. So I'm going to riff for 15 to 20 on this. So I recently actually wrote an article about this um, as a guest article for a great friend of mine who was a fellow friend of the pod, Dusty Hogate. So I wrote uh, this piece for him in his article, uh, newsletter, sorry, Leaving the Ladder. Make sure you go check that out as per the podcast. So what I what I wanted to share was I'm going to start by just kind of explaining a story. And I think this will resonate with so many of you, especially, especially when you're like in the peak busy season, like July, August, and even into September. Uh, this will probably make sense to you. So uh, going way back to, I believe it was 2020 or 21. I think it was 21. About February of 2020, 21, I get an email with a request to bid on a really cool line painting project. It's a mill and pave of a runway, but in a little town about an hour south of us. Uh, Oh, I've I've already butchered it. No, no, no. Sorry. This town, I got my airports mixed up. This one was uh, like nine hours north. Big detail. Totally messed that up. So I get this email from a general contractor and a project manager estimator who uh, I I got along with really well. We're not friends, but uh, we definitely had gone back and forth. I had done striping projects for this company many times before. Mm -hmm. To this day, we still work with them because they're right here in Prince George. So anyways, the guy's name was also Matt. Uh, he wasn't as cool as you though, Matt, don't worry. He was, he was a cool guy. So he sends me this email and he's, uh, bid request for the pavement markings, mill and pave in this small town called Fort Nelson, British Columbia. And I look at it because I'm interested, right? Like this is a big deal. So I look at the scope and I'm digging through it and I'm I like it in 2021. I didn't really know what I was doing, honestly. Like I, I really was, especially with construction drawings, just trying to like figure it all out and make sense of it. And I figured out that, okay, I get what they're going to do. They're going to basically put a, a, they're going to mill off a bunch of the pavement. They're going to recycle it immediately and put this like recycle layer down. Then uh, the pavement marking contractor has to go right behind them and put on temporary paint markings because the reason why they're temporary is they're going to put a brand new lift of pavement on top of that. So now it's going to be this beautiful restored surface. So, I'm looking at it and I realize that, you know, logistically, not only is the town nine hours away, but like you have to be there every single day because the requirements of the project stated that the paving contractor um, can only mill and pave up to, I think it was like 150 meters. So basically like 450 feet uh, a day. That was the max. So even if they were able to do that super quick, Like they were limited into like, it was like 150 meters or so a day. So that means that they're going to be paving for basically, you know, when the nighttime shutdown comes, because it's a night paving job, they're going to start paving at like 8 p.m. probably. Um, They'll probably be done paving at like, depending on the day, could be midnight, could be 1 a.m. And then the pavement marking contractor goes behind them, puts down either the temporary or the permanent markings. So the idea is when you're on a runway, You can't have a blank runway. Planes are coming every day, even in small towns. So I'm looking at this and I'm like, dude, if I bid on this, if I even try to do this, like this is going to break my company in half. I knew right away it was a six figure opportunity, which is awesome. Anytime you have an opportunity to work on a six figure revenue project or seven figure, it's a good day. But I'm looking at it and I was like, 
if we have to, you know, for safety reasons, you can't send one person, you're going to have to have two people there every day for basically six weeks. And at the time, there were three and a half of us that worked in the company. So I'm thinking about it. I'm looking at the schedule. Like this project begins in July. Like I don't see this happening because like literally it's going to like completely steal two people. So even if we had two people back home, um, you, you know, you're not going to be able to really fulfill um, the, the work that you're expecting to do back home. It was just too big of a project for our small company. So as the business owner, I decided, no, we're not going to bid it. Now, why am I telling you this story? What does this have to do with separating sales and operations? The point of the story is that when you're the business owner and the company is smaller, like under 500K, under a million, you know, it's not that big. Um, when the company's that size, as the business owner, you know what your company is capable of doing. And you also basically have complete authority and autonomy to dictate what projects we will do and what projects we won't do. So in other words, like if this were a perfect world, we would scale our businesses to match the demand of, you know, opportunities with our ability to produce it, right? So if we're expecting to grow our revenue, we're going to hire more people and everything would just be hunky-dory. You know, we, we would meet all the customers' demands. We wouldn't say no to any projects. There'd be no drop in quality of workmanship and, you know, everything would just be smooth. But it doesn't always work like that. It's very hard to balance that because there's so many unknowns in business. It's hard to know uh, what you can and what can't do and what you should and shouldn't do. So the ironic part of that story is we ended up doing the project anyways, because they phoned us in July saying like, we're desperate. Our contractor just walked off the job. How fast can you get here? And so we managed to pull it off and it was brutally hard. And I'm proud of our guys that did it because it was unbelievable. But um, as your company gets bigger and bigger, you need to start separating the sales opportunities from the operations abilities. So in other words, what is the job of a salesperson or what is the job of the sales department? Their job is pretty much like sales is simple, man. Generate revenue generating opportunities, push the revenue ball down the field, discover new customers, you know, grow the business by acquiring those contracts operations job is to actually execute what's handed to them by the sales department. Their job is to make sure it all goes to plan. So when we start our businesses, guys, whether it's a striping company, a seal coating company, like you are both departments, unless you, you, you do hire someone like a salesperson early in the game. I suppose that's possible, but generally speaking, our companies are so dependent on us and we are chiefly responsible in our, in our day-to-day duties like we are responsible for driving the sales but also ensuring operations are met so a lot of you listening out there today will probably resonate with that like okay yeah if i just stopped selling today the sales will disappear or conversely if i stop managing the operations and you know ensuring we have the equipment and being out in the field whatever that looks like the jobs won't get done and so you you probably are in both seats if you're a smaller company so, um, you have the luxury as the business owner of throttling back what your company can and can't do based on essentially how much work can you tolerate as the business owner. So in my case, when that project came up, I was like, we can't do this. Like this is going to break our company in half. I, n- none of my employees wanted to go spend six weeks in Fort Nelson, um, You know, I like it up there, but I wouldn't want to spend six weeks up there. So for us to be able to pull that off, it was just going to be too much. So I said, no, over time, that mentality will keep your company small. It's okay to a point when the business is dependent on the owner. It makes sense. You know what you have to say no to so that you don't work 110 hours a week and have no sanity and no life and no family. But as the company grows, your job is to separate the sales and the revenue generating opportunities from the operations aspect. So in other words, what's up, Pod Squad? This episode of the show is brought to you by our friends 
at Mighty Line Floor Tape. So true story, our company started using Mighty Line. We found the product like uh, half a year ago, 2023, we found it and we started using it and I was blown away. The product is incredible. And so many of us in the striping industry want to do interior striping, but we also know that interior striping on concrete usually does not work out very well. This is a fantastic solution. If you have customers that want safe walk lines or customized floor decals, check out their website on Mighty Line. Uh, it's incredible. They have an awesome portfolio of stuff. And if you've never tried the product before, head to the website, let them know that you got the info from the podcast and they will actually send you a free sample box. Check it out, Mighty Line Floor Tape. We are so grateful for them to be sponsoring the podcast. Um, as our companies grow, usually we hire people in operations first, so production. We hire someone to help us in the field. Maybe we hire like an office person to help with like scheduling and invoicing and those kinds of things. And that's, that's usually where we start. Most business owners usually retain the sales activities for themselves. It's a little bit harder of a task to let go. You know, we've put out great content on that, by the way. But it's hard to let go of sales and trust other people to do that. So eventually, though, what happens when you start to hire in your sales department? Let's say that you, you do hire a full-time sales rep, you know, and their job is to generate revenue generating opportunities and to push the ball down the field. Um, the progression in every company is going to look differently, but these two departments, your salesperson and your operations manager, they have to work like independently of each other, not completely independently, but they have to learn to operate independently. In other words, like when, when, if you're a small business owner listening to this, maybe you went through this this year in 2024, maybe you've been through it in years past. Let's say you get to like August, the schedule is full. You're booked out like weeks in advance and you got people asking like, how fast can you come? How fast can you come? And not only do you have those people that you've already signed contracts with, but now you still have inbound leads coming. Like you're not even, you're not even doing any outbound sales. You're not trying to find work. You just have all this work coming in and what happens when you get that like monster job, or maybe it's like a series of properties that, you know, it's going to be a larger scope of work. Like you might just have it in you to say, I, I got to say no, right? This happens in every industry. Contractors will say like, look, reasonably, I don't think I can do this. We're just stretched too thin, right? And, and maybe part of that is they just don't have like the, the ability at that point to scale to meet demand, or maybe it just freaks people out and they have no idea how to hire and grow and scale a business. In, in which case you should listen to our content because we talk about that. Um, but you basically like can just take your foot off the gas and in a small business, that's okay. Like you focus on what's already sold, you catch up, you make sure that you're not booked out for weeks. And then as you start to catch up, that's when you can start looking at opportunities again. And you kind of go in this cycle, right? When your company's bigger, do you know what happens when you tell your sales rep, I need you to not sell this contract because we can't actually handle it because we're so already we're already so busy and we're booked out? Your sales rep will probably go find another job. Because their job is singularly focused, sell stuff, and you lose the ability to tell them, don't do the thing that I hired you to do because operationally we can't handle it, right? A salesperson is wired for one thing, they sell stuff. Going to a salesperson and saying, don't sell stuff is like telling a lion not to like savagely eat a gazelle that's like got his back turned to him and like easy prey. Like it's not in their instinct it's not in their job contract to do that. They're probably just going to sell it anyways. Or at the very least, you know, a sales rep might accommodate you for a little while. They might go like, you know what? I know the company's growing and we couldn't scale up to meet the demand. So I'll throttle it back. And maybe that works for a little bit, but I promise you over the long term, you can't do that. So that's what the separation of sales and operation looks like. Your job as the business owner, when you start hiring across both these two departments, your job is to facilitate and make sure, can this department, can the sales department properly support the demands that we can do operationally? And if operation starts to get too busy, what will you do to solve that problem? Or even conversely, if, if there's not enough work, 
And your operations people are staring across the desk at the salespeople going, what are you doing over there? Like, we need work or we're going to lay people off, right? You have to, you, you have to separate them, but at the same time work to cohesively as a company across two departments in order to keep the ball moving down the field and grow the company. So this, this is a big change, like huge change from most of us. Uh, and most of you who are listening to this, you're probably not at a business where you have that complete separation of your sales department and your operations. Um, I, you know, I, I picked a lot on the, the salespeople there. Like <laughs> you can't tell a salesperson not to sell, but it's no different in operations either. Like if you have someone in your operations department who is responsible for delivering and executing what is sold, like, that is their responsibility, and you can't expect uh, an operations person to go to the salesperson and say, can you cool it down a little bit? Like, we're dying over here. Like, if a salesperson goes up to an operations manager who's already busy or a project scheduler, however it works in your company, if, if the salesperson goes to the ops person and drops, like, 50 new sales contracts off and says, here you go, you know, the operations person can't look at the salesperson and go, like, you can't do that. Right. The salesperson's going to say, have fun. Like I delivered for you. Now it's your time to deliver for the company. Right. Um, so if the salesperson is not producing enough, your operations people can get pretty antsy and they could start like, you know, I, I, I believe that when your company is slow, like at this time, at the time we're recording, it's we're at the end of the pavement season. So we're slowing down a lot. It was cold this morning, man. We're not really exactly doing a ton of striping anymore. But um, that's a great opportunity for like, um, you know, winterizing equipment, getting ready for the off season, in our case, getting ready for snow removal. Um, if you're slow during the year, it's a great time for like systems and processes, training. Um, but if it's, if it's too slow, if it's too slow in the company, your operations people are, are going to have some really uncomfortable conversations with people in production who would like to work, but there's simply no work. And so these two departments, again, they have to work together. What holds a lot of companies back is they have not reconciled the fact that there needs to be a separation of these two departments. So even, and this is painful, this, this part's painful. Even if you as the business owner are choosing to be responsible for one of those two departments, whether it is sales or operations, mm -hmm. like the way you ran it when it was just you or just you and a few people, it simply won't work when you bring in someone else to run the other department. Okay. So if you're going to, if you decide in your company, like I'm going to handle all the sales, this is what I did. I'm not an operations person. So I'm going to handle all the sales. You guys manage the operations. I was guilty of this. The people that I had in my operations department two, three years ago, uh, probably two years ago, um, you know, we promoted them very quickly. I was asking a lot of them relative to the experience and skill set that they had. We were basically still hiring generalists and, and training them on the fly. And there were times as a salesperson, literally in, like in 2022, I was the only salesperson. Um, there were times where I said no to projects because I knew that these poor people who were, you know, I was trying to get, make them qualified and trying to put them in roles to succeed. They simply wouldn't be able to handle it. Um, that will keep your company small for a very, very long time. You need to somehow um, mentally separate these two things, whether you're in a department or not. Um, and and there, there will be a time where you have to let these departments run by themselves, or at the very least with your oversight, but without you pumping the brakes on any of those things. So I did write in my article for Dusty that you can go too far with this too. Like you could get separate them so much when I have this complete wall between the two departments. So separating the sales and ops does not mean that they're working independently of each other. Like they need to work hand in glove. You know, I, I feel like a good example of this is at our company. Um, it like our sales rep completely understood that when it's October, you know, 15th and it's like getting cold and literally it could snow anytime. We're, we're going to have an actual capacity to what we can produce. That's common sense, right? Like if it's going to snow in two weeks, we can't sell a month's worth of work. So you need to make sure that there's a good communication between those two departments. So what do you do with this information? To conclude, if you grew your company this year, if you took it from like, 
you know, low six figures to like, maybe you're up to like the half a million dollar mark, or maybe you're getting close to the million dollar mark in revenue and you're growing and you want to keep that company growing. I would really challenge you to look at, um, what your two departments look like right now. Are they operating independently of each other? Or at this point, are you still kind of involved in both and kind of dictating and moving the pieces to make sure that it works so that, you know, we still sell stuff, but we can still fulfill it. And I'm not overworked as the business owner, right? What I see happening a lot is if business owners in this industry are overworked, if they're stressed out, if they're like just trying to make it all work, I mean, you, you might just need to bring in more people at that point to help you. But I would, I would challenge you to look at the level of separation between your two departments. Um, I wrote this in the article when a business intentionally slows down one department. So if you pump your foot on the brakes, um, thinking that it's going to try and save you like some stress, it's actually going to cause more tension in the company because people will see that and they will get used to that. And you will build this culture where one department is accommodating the other. And I'm telling you, that's not a place where you want to be. So separating it is hard, especially if you, if you're like me and you started your company from like nothing and it was just you, um, you know, now in the company, we have like 15 people and we have separate departments and people in those two departments. So it, it can be difficult to like rewire and reframe your brain as to like how you make this work. Um, if you want more information, reach out to me. I think this is a critical thing for businesses under the seven figure revenue mark who are trying to grow. And it can be an uncomfortable thing, but it's also a very manageable thing. And uh, if you want to chat more about it, you reach out and I will chat with you about it. All right, that's it. Separate your sales and operations department, keep your stripes hot, and I'll talk to you next week.